All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first lecture about the asteroids. So we've come a long way. We've talked about the non-lilioid monocots and all of the rosids. Now we're going to focus on this large clade, the asteroids, which there's again this basal grade here in light blue that we're going to talk about today, which I'm calling the super asteroids. They do not form a clade. And then we will talk about the two major clades in subsequent lectures, the lamids over here and the campanulates. Okay, so what defines this broadest asterid group, including the super asterids, but we're going to see some kind of variations from that theme. Well, in general, the big one is fused petals or sympetally, fusion, 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 um, particularly within the petals, though, of course, we can get fusion within the other uh, whorls as well. You're really not going to have separate pistils per flower in this group. Stamen number is going to drop down, being equal to at the most or sometimes less than the petal number. So again, that kind of big trend, reduction in fusion. And usually the stamens are going to be fused to the corolla too. So the corolla is going to have fusion at least at the base, if not for the entirety. Um, and then the um, filamentous region at least is going to be fused. Um, there are some interesting secondary compounds um, that we're going to talk about. One that's shared between all asteroids are iridoids. Um, so this is showing two different groups of asteroids, the Rubiaceae or the coffee family, Scrofularia or the snapdragon family, and they're um, very specific iridoids. These again are secondary compounds to prevent herbivory uh, by insects. And uh, you can see just a slight deviation. Um, in general, the asteroids have only one layer of integuments. So you might have learned in bio of plants that angiosperms share the ancestral feature of having two layers of integuments around each ovule. We will see one lo layer lost in most asteroids. The big ones again are reduction in the number of stamens and fused petals. Okay, so this basal group, the super asteroids that we're going to talk about, we're primarily focusing on two big orders, the Caryophyllales and the Ericales today. But here's some of the other ones. Um, some other things to kind of highlight in this group. There's lots of mistletoes in this group here. I am not at all sure about the Berberidopsidales. Um, lots of things in the Caryophyllales we're going to focus on. Um, the Cornales is an important one out west. We do have things like dogwood and the stick leaves that we might see, as well as the hydrangeas. It just chose not to focus on that. And then tons of diversity within the Ericales, so the two big ones. Okay, we're going to do the Caryophyllales first and then the Ericales. So the Caryophyllales or the Caryophyllids um, is an exciting group of plants that was kind of a surprise to botanists. Um, it had not been postulated by the morphologists. It was really the molecular systematists that solidified the, or, the different families that belong to this order. But there are some cool themes that kind of make sense. This order is really good at dealing with stressful environments. Um, many of the groups that we're going to talk about really have thrived and diversified within desert or arid regions, including areas with lots of salt. Um, so salt marshes uh, are where halophytes or salt loving plants grow. So this is an example of the kind of habitat where my colleague Kelly Shepherd's um, plants in the Salicornii of the Kenopodiaceae Amaranthaceae group live in Australia, but they also are found here in North America as well. Um, within the Caryophyllales, it's pretty interesting to study the diversification of photosynthate adaptations for life on a dry planet, um, repeated evolution of C4 and CAM photosynthesis, which is pretty interesting across the order lots of succulents, loss of leaves, 
and ability to kind of cordon off or actually excrete salt from salty environments. Um, another extreme habitat where this group has diversified is also really stressful, alpine and tundra habitats, um, including here in Colorado, uh, which can be very, very dry. Um, there's only flowing water that's not frozen for a very small portion of the year, extreme winds, extreme UV radiation. The same groups have often diversified um, in both types of habitats. So we'll talk about the Caryophyllaceae uh, in particular, as well as the um, Polymoniaceae and alpine habitats today. Um, certainly there are major weeds within this group. Um, hopefully on one of our field trips, we're gonna get to see tamarisk, uh, which is a invasive tree along a lot of the waterways in the West and just sucks up water. Uh, and then here's actually baby's breath or gypsophila. If you've ever received like a cut flower arrangement, it has that white kind of tiny flowered friend in that. That's baby's breath, um, but it can uh, escape and become a weed, especially in desert habitats. Okay, another cool feature of the Caryophyllales is a novel pigment. So one cool thing to maybe study someday, especially if you're at all interested in biochemistry or even like human nutrition, are all of the pigments that plants use, especially for fruits and flowers. Um, so in general, across angiosperms, um, there's a group of pigments called anthocyanins that do a lot of the colorings um, in many families. However, in the caryophyllales, the anthocyanin pigment pathway evolved novel functions to produce a whole other suite of biochemical, um, actually only two kind of groups of biochemical uh, pigments, the betalanes. Okay. So um, here's domesticated beet, which is in this group, and the reds, violets, and yellows that you see, those are made by betalanes, which evolved at the base of the caryophyllales. So this is a phylogeny from a recent paper where they're looking again at the caryophyllales as a whole and kind of the two major clades. And where you start to see the purpley violet, that's what the families today that have betalanes. Um, there's been a couple reversions or losses of betalanes getting back to anthocyanins. But what they figured out actually is like, so this is the same phylogeny over here turned on its side. Um, here is the point at time in evolutionary history, history where betalane pigments evolved. But prior to that, in ancestors deeper within the caryophyllales, there were duplica duplication events of important genes. And then the duplicated versions could take on novel functions. So these duplications earlier in the family um, over time then accrued new function, which led to betalanes. And this is actually showing kind of like the biochemistry path moving between an ancestral anthocyanin and all of the uh, proteins involved in that and modifications to getting to betalanes. So C, organic chem and biochem can work with evolutionary biology and botany. I am going to take a break for one second here. I think my dog's about to be sick, y'all. Oh my goodness. Okay, crisis averted. All right, so now let's talk about the families within the Caryophyllaceae. The first one we're gonna talk about, well, I'm gonna kind of pair them, maybe based on things that might get confused. I'm gonna talk about the tiny flowered ones first, and then we'll talk about the bigger flowered ones. The Chenopodiaceae. So this is an herbaceous family, um, though we actually have some woody kind of shrubby members as well, not really trees. Worldwide distribution, fairly large. Includes really important domesticated crops, beets and spinach, as well as quinoa or amaranth. Um, the relationship of this family to um, the amaranthaceae is kind of one of these areas of up for debate, whether they should be two separate families, the quinoa family and the quinopodiaceae, or one uh, is kind of ongoing. 
Um, the, fe- the, the plant that you see here, Kenopodium album, is a really common k- kind of weedy, though native um, herb here in Colorado. Um, highly variable in form, huge seed numbers. Um, but you see that the Navajo use it medicinally and as an edible plant. Okay, so the flowers are super duper tiny in this. Um, they're going to have little tiny bracts and they're gonna be in tight little congested clusters. They actually lack a corolla. So kind of the showy, it's not very showy at all. That's a five mirrors uh, calyx. Um, there's all the different breeding systems across the Kenopodiaceae that you could ever imagine. Um, the fruit is fairly diagnostic, though again, it's gonna be tiny and kind of hard to see. Uh, you get one seed per fruit, and it's what's called a circumcisal capsule or a utricle. So it has like a little hat on it that pops off in many cases. Sometimes it lacks that. Um, And usually the calyx remains around the fruit once it's mature. So this is actually showing uh, spinach flowers and fruits, which are found kind of in the nodes on a spinach plant that's actually bolted. Um, There are some very showy horticultural species, gomfrena and amaranth. You can buy at garden centers. We'll have some of them with really showy bracts and tiny little flowers, as well as beets, of course. Okay, so the ones that are kind of high quality native um, in Colorado um, include our four wing salt brush, the Atroplex canescens. This is probably about the tallest Kenopodiaceae. Um, it has a very woody base, kind of like a shrub. The shrubbier Kenopodiaceae, um, including Crashininicovia, you're going to want to practice that one a lot, winter fat. Atroplex and Crashininicovias, these can look a heck of a lot like sagebrush, the genus Artemisia in the Asteraceae. They are not that. So you'll want to try and find the reproductive structure and convince yourself it is not the capitulum, which is what the Asteraceae would have. You can also smell for a sagey smell. These will lack it, but it's a kind of a tough thing for beginning botanists to figure out the difference between the Kenopodiaceae that are not weedy and the Asteraceae, the Artemisias. Uh, so Crash and Ninicovia or winter fat will have kind of fluffy white hairs. Uh, the inflorescence is kind of distributed along the uppermost portion of all the stems and there's these long fluffy hairs. It's just very hairy and fluffy. Hairs and indument waxes are a huge big deal in the Kenopodiaceae. Four wing saltbrush is gonna have these really clear, obvious, big old fruits with four wings on them, which is really nice. And you can see they're used by the Navajo medicinally. Okay, big nasty weeds in this group. Um, One of the main ones that's a problem kind of worldwide, especially for agriculture is amaranthus or pigweed. There are many species of amaranthus, many of which are not weedy, but some are quite bad. these pigweeds get huge in fields and they can actually mess up like farming equipment. Another one that actually does, you know, kind of take over a lot of land is very hard to get rid of um, is tumbleweed or Russian thistle, the genus Salsola. Being a tumbleweed, meaning having the entire vegetative body kind of form a circular kind of globy shape and severing at the base so it can tumble about. That has evolved repeatedly. This is probably the main one that you see around. The leaves are kind of reflexed, folding back, and they have kind of a spiky, nasty tip on them and very, very tiny flowers. Okay. New family, the polygonaceae or the buckwheat family. It's similarly going to have very tiny flowers and again, have some horrible weeds and some high quality native plants. Again, mostly herbaceous, a few shrubs. Mm, For the most part, these are in wet regions. Um, 
though there's one huge group that we're going to talk the areogonums, which are really great in arid regions. Um, the leaf arrangement is alternate. The leaves are simple and they have, they uh, emerge from nodes that are swollen. So they have a big old bump. So that's an important feature to kind of learn for certain families is what's going on at the nodes. This one is swollen. The Caryophyllaceae is swollen, but it's going to have very different flowers. Many of the groups have stipules that have fused together into a sheath. So like a papery skirt that wraps around the whole thing. So maybe you can see that here. That is called an ochrea. Now, one thing that's pretty annoying about that is um, probably the biggest genus in the Polygonaceae in Colorado, Areogonum, lacks an ochrea. So it's kind of frustrating. Like I thought I learned this thing. I would always be able to find it. No, not in the biggest genus you would see here, but all the other ones you would. Okay, again, tiny little flowers. And here's the weird thing. These are asterids, right? They should have a base number of five or four. In this case, it's actually a three maras flower, like a monica, yikes. In fact, look at this. It looks kind of like a little lily. This is actually showing a five maris one, but there are quite a few that are sort of three maris in appearance. Furthermore, um, you usually don't have an obviously different um, calyx and corolla. So they're just tepals. So it's kind of like little lilies, but it's definitely not a monocot. Uh, the fruits will be one seed um, per flower, which are three angled. I'll show you a close up of some buckwheat and you'll see that. Um, you know, the ones that we're going to talk about in Colorado are kind of weedy or nice small wild flowers. But this is one that kind of blows my mind. Um, if you've ever been to the beach uh, um, in certain parts of the world, there's these amazing things called sea grapes, which are massive plants that live right on the beach, right on the edge there. And um, huge, huge trees. And that is actually in the polygonaceae. It kind of blows my mind. That's in the same family as the, the little things that I see in Colorado. Okay, so here's a couple edible members of the polygonacy. Rhubarb or Rheum rhubarbarum is, is, is in this family and you're actually eating the petiole of the leaf. Um, if you ever see one go into fruit, it has very similar fruits to other members of the family. Here's buckwheat, um, which is one of many healthy kind of wheat alternatives uh, that you might consider. And you can see that very nice tri triangular um, fruit of each individual buckwheat flower. Okay, so the three largest genera, um, maybe in the globe, but certainly in Colorado are Rumex, polygonum and areogonum. Many rumexes are kind of um, weedy. We'll probably see rumex crispus, which has long leaves with this crisped or undulating edge. Uh, polygonum is often in kind of wet areas, not weed. Um, there's some really terrible weeds, I think, especially from Japan that kind of invade waterways that are in this group. Um, as well as areogonum then. Okay, so areogonum is not a weedy group at all, as far as I'm aware of. Um, huge number of species here in Colorado, but there's even more in California. Um, this genus, unfortunately, lacks an ochrea. So you have to just kind of start to learn like the overall look and the habitat of the family. It tends to be in drier areas, though we do get some up into the alpine. Um, there are bracts underneath the inflorescence. And in many cases, the inflorescence structure is an umbel. So that's one way to know it. You could very easily confuse it for the APAC or the carrot family. Um, so that's kind of one you just sort of have to learn in the field. It, it's tough. Lots of indigenous names and uses for many species of areogonum. I just wanted to share with you. 
Um, lots used in smoking um, and other cultural and ceremonial practices. Okay, now we're on to kind of the more showy families that we're going to learn in the Caryophyllales. So here is the Caryophyllaceae or the carnation, sometimes known as the pink family. Big all around the world. Um, particularly in the Northern hemisphere, particularly in kind of temperate latitudes. So like in the Alps, there's lots and lots of species there. Um, so less so in the tropics. Um, here is Arenaria fendlerii or rockwort, one of many species here in Colorado. Um, highly actinomorphic flowers. This one would be a one to kind of study against, I would say, Saxifragaceae and Crashulaceae, because I think that could be very confusing because the fusion piece is sure not obvious with these flowers. They do have a diagnostic determinate inflorescence form called a dicasia. It's sometimes easy to see, sometimes not. So there's this like Y split and the middlemost flower is the oldest flower that's going to bloom first there. Okay, so this is another family that we always pay attention to when something has leaf arrangement that's opposite and it has swollen nodes. So kind of similar to polygonaceae, but again, these really opposite leaves and big, much more showy flowers, you won't get those confused. Uh, my dear husband just brought me a bunch of carnations for Mother's Day because they're one of my very favorites. And I can tell you right now, I am looking and feeling the swollen stem right where two leaves come together at a node. Very much a five maris flower. The calyx is fused more or less. So here's kind of the base of a dianthus or a carnation where you can see it, but not the corolla. The corolla is often strongly lobed. So sometimes the lobing is so deep that it looks like you have 10 petals, whereas in fact, you only have five. Um, sometimes the base of the petal is what's, or in the middle of the petal is what's called clawing. So it like out of the distal or outermost tip, it's very broad, right? Like here. But if you were to go in, you would see it narrows abruptly kind of towards the interior. Um, there are one or two whorls of anthers. So kind of one of our themes is going to be reduction down to one whorl. So you see that sort of here, but still a couple whorls in some groups and a single pistil, right? Of two to five carpels with quite a few styles. So again, Crashulaceae is going to have multiple pistils per flower. So you won't confuse it with that. Saxifragaceae is gonna have two styles. You're meh, more or less not going to see that here. And, and that would have a hypanthium, which this group lacks. Um, we will start to see placentation type as very important for identifying, certainly in the asterids. This group has free central or axial placentation. And the fruits are capsules, so dry that open up, but they're not like loculicidal capsules um, or septicidal capsules like we've seen before where the entire carpal line suture opens up. Rather, it just opens up at the very tip and there's kind of some toothing or even some little valves up there. So it does not slit along the side like we see in other groups. Okay, so here's kind of one like lawn weed, but there's also good members of this genus as well, showing all of those features. So a good number of styles, probably 10 stamen in two layers, highly notched petals. There's five of them, they're not fused, and a fused calyx outside of that. Um, two, so Arenaria is a good group to know, as well as Silene. Um, Here's one of many examples of alpine groups that we see. So Silenia collis or moss campion is a very common alpine flower. So big, ridiculous flowers embedded in a very tight mound of highly reduced down leaves and stems forming kind of that cushion. 
much taller ones like Silene vulgaris, and here is a Dianthus, another member of the genus. We will see Dianthus in lab. Um, a weedy one that we see a lot, which is good for dissection, is bouncing bet or soapwort, Saponaria officinalis, which is good for learning the features. Okay. Everyone loves this. Another member of the Caryophyllaceae are the cacti, the cactus family. So we talked about the convergent evolution between the Euphorbiaceae in the old world and the Cactaceae in the new world. So vegetatively, they can look similar in desert habitats, but we will now look at the features that unite all Cactaceae, which are lacking in Euphorbiaceae. Okay. For the most part, these are going to be succulent plants with a lot of water storage tissue protected by spines. And there's at least 1400 species found throughout the New World tropics with the exception of one genus that makes it into Africa. Um, fleshy succulent stems are kind of what this group is known for. There are some very interesting epiphytic lineages. So remember we talked about epiphytes are plants that live on top of other plants that don't harm this. In the tropics, there are um, the genus Ripsalis and some other of, of these um, cacti that are epiphytic with kind of a flatter stem, really lacking the, the um, spines. There are no leaves at all in the family with the exception of the genus Pereschia. So here's some Pereschia. You can see it actually has leaves and as well as spines. We're gonna see the spines actually originate from the axillary meristem. So you can see, you can imagine that that's what was created there. Uh, but every other group completely lacks leaves. Um, what are found when the leaves are lacking, right? Are spines like what we see here or glockids, which are barbed hairs, barbed inwards, which are really painful. That whole region where the stems and the glockids originate from is called the areole. The flowers of cacti are absolutely beautiful and usually giant and showy, especially compared to the size of the vegetative body. Huge contrast to Euphorbiaceae, with the weird cyathea, which tend individually to be rather small. So not a lot of reduction in fusion here for sure. Um, there is fusion between a undistinguished perianth. So we can't tell if they're petals or sepals. There's just sort of this long gradation of form here. Um, and they are fused at least at the base to the androecium, but there's tons and tons, so that's why we have the infinity sign, tons of perianth or tepals and tons of stamen. And all of that is above the ovary, which is sunk down. And that's a really good protected place to be because a lot of these are going to be pollinated by kind of less sure flyers. So here's a giant saguaro, right? and it's going to be pollinated by bats. Um, so having the ovary in a sunken down position is good. And then all of these kind of scales and all the glockids and stuff that go along with it, that will be made into the outer wall of the fruit. This group, it has a placentation type of parietal in which they are actually embedded in the side. So looking at this figure here, the black is the ovary wall, all the carpels fused together. And then there's like little outgrowth bumps and the ovules are embedded in that. So that is a defining feature of the cacti. The overall fruit type is a berry. So that's kind of fun to know. And that's cool seeing actually the fruits of that Pereschia, the cactus with true leaves, as well as the beloved like prickly pear cactus fruit used for making all kinds of sweet jellies and other preserves in our region by all kinds of people. Um, so many different forms. So cacti people, of which there's so much interest globally, a lot of hobbyists, collectors, etc. You can group them into columnar, so long skinny columns, kind of the flat pad, the prickly pear like we have, opuntias, barrels with kind of that giant singular mound, as well as vines. So here is like the genus Ripsalis, 
which is one of these like epiphytic vining cactus. Uh, there's still a lot of phylogenetic work that needs to be done within this to figure out how many times and in what order these various forms evolved. So here is a very important um, sacred plant, Lovophora Williams, Williamsonii, uh, peyote or mescaline um, used by Native Americans uh, for uh, traditional religious practices and certified to be used by various indigenous um, religious groups today. So peyote. Um, here's another fun one, the queen of the night, which factored into, what was it? The movie Crazy Rich Asians, where they all sit around and watch the cactus blooming. I've been to parties where people have like a giant one of these and they're waiting for it to bloom at night. Just this massive white flower, they're really fun. Okay, here in Colorado, um, kind of mm, three main groups maybe to know, Apunchas or the prickly pears. Um, we have a number of species in our area differing in spininess, length of spines, glockids, etc. The cylindro puncher, the choyas, which is kind of a narrowly columnar branching cactus, um, which really starts to be incredibly abundant on the south side of Colorado Springs, heading south down to Pueblo, then it's everywhere. And then a very tiny spherical um, kind of columnar cactus, Echinocereus brutiflorius, or the hedgehog cactus. So one feature to, to learn to look for when you're trying to identify cactus is is the stem arranged in true ribs? So like kind of accordion folds, or is it only in bumps or mounds, like a mountain range that would be called tubercles. So a kind of serious has true ribbing, whereas a thing you might confuse it for with pink flowers, pedio cactus has only tubercles. Okay, now we are going to move on to the next order, the Ericales. Um, this is a huge group of, of plants globally, um, over 11,000 species, but I'm just going to focus on two of the families, the blueberries and the phlox family, that are particularly important here in Colorado. Okay, so a big group, but still less than 6% of the Yukot diversity. A third of those are in the blueberry family, Ericaceae alone, but in certain areas, particularly in the tropics, this group is absolutely huge. So there was one study that found if you were to classify just all of the stems emerging out of a lowland rainforest in the new world, about 22% of those would be in the Ericales. So a very globally important group. Okay. So it has lots of cool tricks up its sleeves, quite different tricks than the Caryophyllales. This group has really intense associations with mycorrhizae or the fungi down in the um, soil. We'll talk a lot about that. And we actually have the evolution of mycorrhizal parasites or mycotrophs, which entirely jettison their chlorophyll. They aren't able to photosynthesize and they get all of the fixed sugar they need from the mycorrhizae underground, which of course are getting it from the trees. So that's pretty wild. Um, we have truly parasit parasitism um, beyond fungal, like plant parasitism evolving repeatedly, as well as carnivory. Uh, so Saracenia is one of many groups of carnivorous plants. There's quite a few uh, different forms of carnivory within the Ericale, so an exciting thing. This allows this group to do really well in particularly nutrient poor soils, boggy soils, acidic soils, um, understories of pines like and other gymnosperms like we have in Colorado here, very acidic nutrient poor soils often, which allow this group in particular to flourish. The Ericales, as in this basal grade of asterids, um, shows sort of a weird mixture of features between rosids and asterids. So some things are very mainline asterid, but some things kind of retain more of an ancestral rosid feature. 
So for example, some groups like Fokiria, which you might get to see if you were to take Shane's desert plant ecology class in Arizona have true sympetaly or fusion. Some though maintain individual petals. This uh, cannonball tree is from Brazil, which is pretty crazy. So this is just a phylogeny of this basal grade of Astralis kind of showing the blue would be the sympetaly. And you see it's kind of evolving repeatedly all over the place. Uh, so basically, Corolla evolution is complicated. There might be one or two origins of it, and then reversions back to separate or choropetaly. Similarly, remember how I told you the asterids is defined by having one integument on the outside of an ovule? Well, we do have retention of two integuments in certain groups, like you see over here. Similarly, like kind of looking at how that's evolved, very complicated, multiple switches again, probably from one direction to the other. So this is the kind of stuff people like to do with phylogenies is figure out how, how often did something evolve and in what direction. And finally, stamen number. So in some groups, we see one whorl of stamens, the Polymoniaceae, which we're gonna see. But some groups retain kind of more of an ancestral state of multiple whorls, um, like the T family, which is in this group. Okay, so turning our attention to the true Ericaceae, also known as the blueberry family. So we talked about lots of edible delicious berries in the Rosaceae. The Ericaceae has quite a few as well. So blueberries and cranberries and huckleberries are in this group. These do really well, again, in nutrient poor soils, bogs, etc. cetera. Um, in like the Northern, like the Midwest, as well as the South where there's a lot of blueberry farms, right? You think sandy soils, boggy acidic soils, cranberry bogs, things like that. Um, the reason they're able to be so successful in these challenging habitats, again, is because of really important mycorrhizal relationships. Um, you can see morphologically something called hostoria, which is a direct connection of the root to the fungus, as opposed to being rather superficial. It is a very deep tissue to tissue contact, um, which is going to allow for really efficient sharing of nutrients and carbon back and forth. Again, we see multiple groups. Here are two Colorado native plants that have kind of started cheating in this mutualism and they become mycotrophs, which are essentially um, parasitizing and eating the, the nutrients from the fungi. Um, and so here's pine sap, and then giant pine drops. You can see these kind of in midsummer at kind of montane elevations in Colorado. They're super weird. They never green up. They sort of have the ursiolate or urn shaped flower that's characteristic of Ericaceae. So we'll see that in just a second. Now, vegetatively, you can often tell the Ericaceae, they have leathery, tough leaves that are evergreen. So this group is generally really not going to have soft deciduous leaves that truly fall. You will see them kind of turn red in the fall a bit, but they, they maintain on the stem. Uh, many times the lower portion of the leaves is revolute or rolled under, like you see here in Labrador T. The stomata are often in a sunken position on the bottom of leaves. Again, a really good location for water retention and covered with hairs. So uh, here's bearberry, Arctostaphylus erva ursii, also known as kinnikinnik, that we're going to talk about because that's a really important, very low kind of creeping shrub in our region. Okay, now turning our attention to the flower. This is very much a kind of core asteroid look. Baseline of fours and fives, lots of fusion in the calyx, fours or fives in the corolla, high fusion. Very, very much fusion in most groups that you would see. 
um, kind of a fairly numerous androecium, and then we'll talk a bit about the gynoecium. Um, again, this urn-shaped or vase-shaped is how I know the ericaceae wherever I go in the world. Now, many of the species have buzz pollination. So we'll see this in the Solanaceae as well. But that is where the anther, again, does not dehiss in a slit along the side, but rather from a pore up top. And the vibration of the wings of bees is required to shake the pollen out. So again, this is a highly dependent upon bee group for the most part. Um, in general, um, kind of the family shares having a single superior pistil per flower, but in the blueberry chunk of the ericaceae, it actually drops down to being inferior. So that's why it's kind of on both sides here. The fruit is often a fleshy berry in the ones especially that we consume. You also see dry capsules with four or five partitions. And each of those fruit types has lots and lots of tiny seeds. So if you ever have had like blueberry seeds or um, cranberry seeds, I don't know, you might have a memory of how tiny they are. Okay, so a really critical plant, again, Arctostaphylus uva ursi or bearberry you see has names and uses um, by many indigenous people. Again, a lot of smoking and ceremonial uses for this group. Um, it is a very important uh, food source for lots of animals. Again, a fleshy fruits adapted for dispersal via animals. And ignore that it says this is seen on beaches. That's a remnant of when I used to teach this in Wisconsin. And we were talking about the beaches of like Lake Michigan. Nope, doesn't apply there. Uh, here we see it in lots of kind of communities in the montane, even heading up. Very, very common in the understory. Okay, so here's some native, other native groups. Um, the whortleberry and the dwarf blueberry. We have multiple species of the genus Vaccinium in Colorado. Um, many of them are edible. So if you're interested in, again in foraging, this is a pretty good group. Famous last words, but I don't really think you can poison yourself with ericaceae like you can with others. Um, they will actually have an inferior fruit. You can hopefully see it there and there. And they produce delicious berries. I have very fond memories as a child of picking huckleberries in Montana. Another kind of medicinally interesting group are the winter greens, which you can see kind of as you head into the upper montane region of Colorado um, in the midsummer. Um, these have that classic winter green smell to the leaves like gum. They're not in the mint family like peppermint. Winter green is a totally different thing. And finally, and a much smaller group to look at is the Phlox family Polymoniaceae. Um, it's again, gonna be very temperate. So again, we're thinking about like the Alps, uh, but it moves down here into the Himalay and it's very species rich, particularly in Southwestern North America. I'm thinking down into the deserts of kind of like um, Death Valley, California, down into the Baja, into Mexico, and there's really interesting uh, radiations of groups throughout the Andes. Okay, this is looking a lot more mainline asterid, okay? Five maris flowers, no variation in five. The stamen are going to be at different heights, so some are short and some are long oftentimes. Three fused carpels, Three, three styles. So one, two, three, five of different heights and fusion between the corolla and the androecium. So just like I told you at the beginning, it kind of the defining features of all asteroids, we finally truly see it in this group. Um, one of our big genera flocks. Um, these are garden flowers, but we will see these bloom all throughout Colorado, all these different species at different elevations, including in the alpine. So just like that Silene that we saw in the Caryophyllaceae, this group has species that are endemic to the alpine, again, with that very cushiony vegetation and then big old flowers plunked right in the middle of it. Phlox, you can tell from the other genera, has opposite leaves that are simple and entire. Often they're kind of needle-like. 
Um, and at least in my garden here, they're some of my earliest bloomers. And then the other two groups, so Polymonium or Sky Pilot, also known as Jacob's Ladder, has alternate leaves, but they're pinnately compound. So it can like superficially kind of look like a Fab ACE, but they have these really beautiful like sky blue to white flowers and they tend to be at higher elevations or where there's more moisture. And finally, the genus Ipomopsis, which is one of Shane Heschel's very, very favorite things in our department. Um, he and his students over many years have been studying variation in floral color and pigmentation in this group, particularly kind of dark red to white and um, fitness costs um, and contributions of that pigment throughout the plant body. We actually have quite a bit of variation here um, and it recruits different pollinators. So a very long corolla too, kind of reddish to white. So that's gonna be very much recruiting in hummingbirds in many cases and leaves in a basal rosette. And that is all we're going to do for right now.